Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Diplomatic Notes. This is a show that I'm doing on YouTube, and it relates to, I guess you would call, activism, political involvement, and diplomatic engagement. That's what I would want to call it. So today, we are talking about the recent situation with George Floyd in Minnesota. And if you want to give it a topic today, it's called Responding to Racism. Now, why is this important? First of all, let me explain a little bit about diplomatic notes. I'm a diplomat, okay? I'm not a credentialed diplomat of the government of the Bahamas or the United States or any other government, but I am a diplomat according to what the Bible says, the Bible says we are kingdom ambassadors, we are ambassadors of Christ. So I consider myself a diplomat, which means that I should be, and all of us should be engaged in local affairs and give wisdom to these situations. So with that said, um, I wanted to ad address the whole issue of racism and then specifically the situation with George Floyd. So let's begin with racism. Uh, one of the common mistakes that people make when it comes to racism is we tend to think racism is about color. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, we tend to frame racism in black and white. It does involve black and white and red and yellow and so on, but racism is not a skin color because Pigmentation has no sense. Pigment, pigment, pigmentation itself has no judgment. What happens is you have black people or white people who buy into a racist ideology. So let's take, for example, the United States and even the current situation. You have many white people who are racist and you have many who are not. So if it were just about skin color, then all white people would be racist. But it's about ideology. So when an ideology circulates in a community or a culture and it becomes adopted, it becomes a norm in that culture. So what we are witnessing today is the remnants of a very widespread norm in the United States. So for example, years ago, you had a lot of races and those races had children. And um, the children over the years adopted that as a norm, as a culture. And so over the years, racism continued. Now, with enlightenment, the ideology of racism has been debunked to a certain extent. It's been defeated to a certain extent. And so you have less people who are buying into the racist ideology. So... You know, I have white friends, and um, many of them are not racist. Some of them may not even realize that they do racist things because it's a part of their culture. And it doesn't mean that only white people are racist. You have black races. You have, you know, races of all different colors. So racism is first and foremost an ideology. So when we want to defeat racism, we cannot defeat a skin color. You know, I, I heard someone... Actually, a friend of mine in London made a statement, and he said, boy, Dave, you know, look like we're going to have, have to have a race war. And I said, um, no, you don't want to have a race war because if you kill white people, then it does not kill the ideology. I said, if you want to engage in a war, you have to war against the ideology, and that's very, very important. So first thing is, Racism is an ideology, it's not a skin color. It involves skin color in the sense that many persons of a certain skin color are racist, and so that's why you know it exists. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the current situation. In the current situation, what we are seeing is that there have been uh, quite a few protests. The, the, uh, the black man who got killed um, or murdered, manslaughter, whatever it is, who, who was harmed by the police and succumbed to his injuries, um, we, we've seen protests erupt. And protests are actually a good thing if they are conducted in the right way. 
when some injustice happens, we are supposed to protest. We are supposed to make awareness to it. We are supposed to be angry. We are supposed to try to get justice and fight for justice. So there's nothing wrong with protests. The problem is when the protest loses its vision or it doesn't understand what direction it's supposed to be going in. So the, pro the protest begins about we need justice for a particular individual, in this case, George Floyd. And then you have a number of elements coming in and it, and it turns into, okay, let's just mash up the place. Let's just burn down things and then they'll get the message. Well, the truth of the matter is, um, historically, people have gotten the message, but it hasn't really accomplished what it was designed to accomplish. So people, in, in most cases, what's happened historically, if we go back to the riots in LA and Miami and other places, what happened is that essentially, in most cases, black people burn down their own communities and then there are no stores to go to, your neighbors are harmed, and so on. So if you're going to do a protest, let it be organized, let it have a specific objective. If you want to engage the police or throw things at police, maybe you throw, you know, water bottles, I mean, not bottles, you know, um, balloons of water, something, something that would get the message that we are angry but not actually physically harm people. The other, the other issue is that some people may feel like, well, you know, the police did this to us and so we need to get the police back. We need to burn down the police building and then we need to attack the police. Well, the truth of the matter is, um, when you attack the police station, you don't know whether you're attacking good policemen or bad policemen. And, I, and the policemen who you may be attacking may be the ones who are in your favor. So what we have to do is to understand how to protest effectively. And when you understand how to protect, protest effectively, it has to be very strategic. If we look back in the civil rights movement, uh, Martin Luther King, they protested, but they had some very uh, well thought out strategies. And I think that's what needs to happen in these kinds of situations. Community leaders need to come together and there has to be a strategy because at the end of the day, you want a solution. You know, you want to be angry and you want to vent, but you don't want to be angry and vent and burn down everything. And then tomorrow, um, you know, the same thing recurs and then you have to burn down again. And then, and, and at the end of the day, the people who are doing the burning down are not the people who are benefiting. And then it creates a lot of anima animosity and chaos. So. With that said, um, let's talk about the most important ingredient, the most important issue. And the most important issue is change. We want to see change. We want things to change. So how does change happen in an environment of racism? The way things happen when it comes to anything, changing anything, but when, when we talk about racism, the way things happen is through negotiation and engagement. And some people will say, well, I don't want to negotiate with them. They are my enemies. Well, the, the people that you want to negotiate more than anyone else, you want to negotiate with more than anyone else, are your enemies. Uh, every war normally is ended through a negotiation. Whenever there's a problem between two parties, Sometimes people end up going to war and killing one another, and the reason they are killing one another and the reason that they went to war is because they never sat down and talked. If they, if they sat down and talked, they would understand either how to sort out their differences or um, how to coexist. And so in this case, we're talking about negotiations for change to happen. Now, how does change happen? Let's talk about change on the individual level and then change on the community and national level. On the individual level, change happens by individual commitment. So let's say this situation happened with George Floyd. There was another one that happened in the Atlanta area. So what each of us needs to do at this point is make a commitment and say, okay, what can I do to bring about change? Some people may say, well, there's nothing you can do. These people are racist. Um, 
That's a very fatalistic approach. And the fact of the matter is change can happen when you engage. And I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna share with you some very specific change strategies. Um, so we have to make a commitment. We have to make a commitment on an individual level and then a national level. On the individual level, you have to say, okay, what can I do? Who can I talk to? Who can I engage with? I'll tell you a story about change to give you an example of how one person making a commitment can make a difference. A friend of mine told a story about him living in a community and he went to put up a basketball court in his community, but the homeowners association came up and they said, uh, no basketball courts in this area. And he asked them why, and you know, they had different explanations, but he concluded that basically uh, they felt like having a basketball court in your front yard meant that black people would be coming over and it would be a danger to the community. So this gentleman, um, he tried to bring about change. Change didn't happen. And so he realized that in the community where he was living in, they had the homeowners association board. And so he went and he ran to, for a position on the board. He got a position on the board. And so then he tabled this issue about the basketball courts. And the issue was defeated, let's say five to three. The next year, he ran to be president. And as president, he reintroduced it. And then the, the, the item came up to the, for, for a vote. And this time around, it was approved four to one. Now, what caused the change? The change happened because he decided to become engaged in the process. In order to change, you need positions of power. You need positions of influence. Either you need to have a seat at the table or the heir of someone who has a seat at the table. But it's always better to have a seat at the table than just to have an heir of someone who is at the table. So we protest, first of all, but after you protest, put yourself in a position to make change happen, to be engaged where change can happen. So we have to use our influence. There may be, you know, in, in, in this context, there are many influential persons in the black community. You have athletes, you have entertainers, you have, um, you know, the former president, you have many, many prominent black individuals, you have some activists. And I think um, these persons need to be engaged from a strategic level. Let me give you an example. So right now we are saying the problem is with policemen. So if the problem is with, is with policemen, then somebody needs to sit down and negotiate with the police department, the sheriffs, the, the federal agencies, and say, okay, let's talk. What are we gonna talk about? We want change. We don't want black people being killed. We don't want pe people being shot unnecessarily and sometimes without due cause. So how, do, how does that happen? Well, first of all, when you engage with the persons in authority, you say to them, um, we want progress. We, the, what's happening now is not acceptable. And here is how we believe change can happen. So if I were giving advice, I would sit down with the police chiefs, the mayor, whoever it is, and I'd say, look, the problem is that you know you have two issues first of all either these persons don't have proper training or these persons are predisposed to racist activity so in order to change that we need training so when you demand training and you say okay let's recommend who can do the training so that the message can be brought across to the officers so that, that, that's something that can actually bring about change. When people see things from a different perspective, when they hear things from the right persons, they change. Now, if the persons are not open to change, then they need to be identified too. So if somebody is a blatant racist, they're not open to change, they're on the police force because they wanna kill people, then we need to track them down. So on the individual level, you can check out the different policemen who are on the police department, check out their Facebook posts, check out their associations, and then you go back to the mayor, to the commissioner, to whoever it is, and say, 
look, I believe this person is a racist and they are predisposed to, you know, harassing or, 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 or harming black people. So when you do that, you actually are engaged in making change happen. Of course, on the macro level, policies need to change. So the mayors, the congressmen, the president, whoever it is, you have to engage with the powers that be to cause change to happen. And here's some other very, very important tools. On the individual level, you can also use your camera. And, and the cameras have proven to, been, to have been very effective. Without a camera, many of these incidences, there would be no story to tell, there would be no argument because the person who could tell the story is dead. So if you have a camera, make sure you record anything that's suspicious, anything out of the ordinary. There was an incident very recently where a man in Central Park, he recorded the offending person saying the racist information and so it was available and everybody could see it. So on the individual level, the camera is very powerful. So you use the camera, you use recordings to make sure that people are exposed who are doing these things and who are perpetrating these things. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about long term, the long journey. For the long term, we have to continue to identify change strategies. Uh, and on, on all levels. Now, in order for change to happen, I, for example, you know, in the NFL, the NBA, uh, through agitation, through negotiations, what you have now is you have persons being, or teams being required to, to hire or to consider minorities. Uh, you have legislation that forces people to make sure that there is diversity. So things like that need to be expanded. Things like that need to be continually um, perpetrated, not perpetrated, perpetuated, so that um, persons of color, black people, uh, Asians, Mexicans, whoever it is, um, have a level playing field and have opportunities the same way white persons have had opportunities. The truth of the matter is that the non-white population in the United States and in many other areas of the world has been disadvantaged and has been um, discriminated against and have been offended by the white, the white populations. It's not everywhere. In some cases, it's been black people who've been racist against other people. But in, in, in the United States and in many parts of Europe, most of where we see a lot of the news today, uh, that's what has happened. You know, the colonialists, um, even here in the Bahamas, you know, here in the Bahamas, um, we we don't really encounter racism on a regular basis because the majority of the population, we have a 90% pop black population, so we don't really have to deal with it. But I remember growing up having to deal with it. Um, coming from a black family, um, you know, my family was discriminated against. Uh, you know, there were there were things where you couldn't go in certain banks, you couldn't go in certain theaters, you couldn't go certain places. So that happened in the Bahamas. But thankfully, we were liberated in 1973. Well, actually, 1967 and then 1973, we became independent and the black majority gained a foothold. And so you don't see a lot of white people. There's, you know, the racism that still exists is more latent and it's in in economics and it's in other areas but we have made progress and we have made progress through legislation engagement activism and those are the three things that you have to do legislation engagement activism and um, when we talk about staying on the wall of course i'm speaking from a christian perspective and one of the most important rules that we need to consider is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So no matter what white people do, um, you don't repeat that process, especially when you are not addressing the persons who have violated you. So if you're just attacking white people in general for some white person who did something bad to you, 
then you're actually creating a bigger problem because these white people who may have been on your side, after you attack them indiscriminately, then they'll look at you the same way you look at them. Why are you, why are you profiling me? The same thing with police. If we decide that you know we're gonna attack all policemen and, and we don't determine what, what their background is and what their philosophy is, what their ideology is, then what we do is we make the policemen more racist than they were before. So a policeman who's good, who's for the black community and he happens to be white, but we go and attack him, then we lose an ally. So it's important from a Christian perspective to always remember, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So um, make sure that you go in with the right attitude if someone is wrong, then you look for justice. You seek all necessary recourses. Um, you don't go out and, and shoot the policeman. You know, you have to look at the legal system. You have to look at the tools available. And, and then, um, you know, change begins. Also in the long haul, um, we have to realize that it's not going to happen with one person and it's not going to happen by complaining. Sometimes we feel like, you know, we complain and agitate. Complaining is important. Agitation is important. But at some point in time, you have to negotiate and you have to get a seat at the table and you have to influence. Uh, I think that this situation is tragic. It's one of many wake up calls and it needs to be addressed. We need to continue to work towards bringing about a resolution. And I believe the key to the resolution are people who are wise, people who are upright, uh, persons like myself and others who are kingdom citizens, who have a unique diplomatic perspective. I believe that together we can make change happen, together we can influence and, and we can make a difference. I am making a difference because I've decided to start this show, Diplomatic Notes, where we get in, involved in, in change, we get involved in activities that some may consider political activities, but when you are a diplomat, you go into a foreign country, you go into different environments, and you, 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 you engage in negotiations. Uh, a, a diplomat is a negotiator, so, and, and a diplomat is also a representative. So. I go in, I represent the kingdom perspective, and I negotiate to cause change to happen. And that's what we all need to do. We need to all go in, negotiate, do what we can to make change happen. And I believe that as we work together, we will see things happen. But remember what I said, racism is not a skin color, it's an ideology. White people are not the enemy, the ideology of racism is the enemy, whether it's black or white or whoever it appears in. Wherever racism appears, racism, the ideology, is, is the issue and it's not skin color. It may happen to be that persons of a certain skin color are predominant in racism, but we have to recognize that even though they may be predominant in that color, it's not because of their skin. It's because of what's in their head. It's because of, of their ideology and the ideology that's been passed down. So thanks once again for, this, for watching this episode of Diplomatic Notes. We are going to be going to do some of our Diplomatic Notes live. The last one that we tried to do, we had some technical difficulties and we weren't able to get live. But the next one, we hope to have live. If we don't have it live, then we're going to be continuing to do our shows um, through recorded broadcasts. So thanks once again. This is Dave Burroughs. Some of you know me as Pastor Dave Burroughs or Dr. Dave Burroughs. But I am a kingdom citizen. I am a diplomat. I am an ambassador. And I am here to represent the KOG in the 242. 242 is the Bahamas location. So whether you're in the 954, the 207, the 305, whatever it is, you represent, you become a diplomat in your arena. Thank you very much.